Welcome to Microsoft Tober, where we're celebrating 10 years of Microsoft Surface, starting with the Surface RT, one of my favorite pieces of technology. Now, the rest of this month, we're going to be celebrating with tons of other Surface devices and Surface coverage. So if you're interested in Microsoft Surface, be sure to get subscribed and check out the playlist that I have linked up here. 10 years ago, a tablet was a tablet and a laptop was a laptop. Microsoft hadn't come to the scene yet, and iPads and Android tablets basically were still relatively new, but had gotten somewhat popular. Most people just saw them as big phones, and their operating systems and their capabilities and feature sets largely pushed them to be just big phones. Now granted, some Android manufacturers had actually tailored their experience a little bit more around keyboard inputs, but not to the extent that we've seen today. Everything has changed because of this device, or at least its successors. Now, the Surface RT in many people's eyes was a failure. Even you could say Microsoft's. Microsoft had to write off a massive amount of inventory because they were unable to sell Surface RTs at the price that they wanted to, or even a break-even price. Now, a lot of things have happened since then, but I still remember the Surface RT fondly. And maybe it's because I'm a Microsoft or a Surface fanboy, but I think the Surface RT really changed my experience and changed the way that I look at technology in general. Seems like a big deal, but let me talk about why. This is NOISO, and this is the Surface RT review after 10 years. When I first bought the Surface RT, I was the first one in line to the Microsoft store in Boston. And it was not really as much of a celebratory event as I expected. I expected similar events to like the iPhone, where people would camp out, line up for days, and wait for the new iPhone to be released, at least in those days. But it really was not like that. While I did see a lot of other mall goers happen to stop by the Surface or the Microsoft store and check out the new products, it didn't really seem that anyone had quite the energy and excitement as I did. Now, I was not as far from a Microsoft fanboy at the time. It was just my interest in getting a Surface RT because I wanted a replacement to the massive 15-inch laptop that I'd been carrying around in my backpack. That thing was powerful, but not really all that practical for a college student that already had two or three textbooks in his backpack at any given time. Let's talk about the Surface itself. While most laptops and tablets at the time were plastic or aluminum, Microsoft decided to go against the grain by designing a magnesium alloy frame, which was interesting, but it has its own flaws. Now, I had a tendency to scratch this up over time. Granted, it was kind of put through the ringer in the process, and it never really looked good after the first day because of how fingerprinty this entire device is. I still love the design because it gives off a more function over form vibe, well, iPads up until the more recent iPads Pro always had kind of a more curvy design, this seemed to be more blocky and more Spartan. I appreciate it, even if it is not quite as seamless and smooth as, as most iPads, even of the time. The Surface was, and still is, built on functionality. You want a full-size USB-A port? We've got it. You want mini HDMI? I'm not sure why, but we've got that too. And even like the MacBook, we've got an equivalent to MagSafe. Now, this was pre, this is the original Surface Connect before the more modern Surface Connect that also passed through data. This only had battery. Uh, this only delivered battery power, which was fine at the time, but, and it was nice to be able to easily magnetically disconnect it, even though I'm not as big of a fan of that as a more open ports like USB-C, for example. What was a bigger deal for me was the USB-A port. Being able to just basically plug in a flash drive very easily and transfer data across devices made this a godsend, especially at a time where cloud storage exists, but it wasn't nearly as prevalent. I decided to go with the Surface Touch Cover. Now, let me talk about why. First of all, this was before even if there were reviews out, I was not really a follower of technology at the time as much. And so I wouldn't have seen any of those reviews or paid attention to any of them. And so basically I was walking in blind. And when I looked at the touch cover side by side with the type cover, I thought, well, this one is thinner. It's $20 cheaper. And it's so much cooler technology because it, it 
gets rid of the old technology that is physical buttons for the keystrokes. Now, uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and we can look back and say, I probably made a bad decision, and I probably wasted $110. But I continued to use the touch cover for years until I managed to get a type cover to replace it with my Surface Pro 2. The touch cover for me was just a part of the Microsoft experience. Yes, it wasn't the most pleasurable thing typing in keystrokes on this, but I loved the fact that the Surface, while typing in keystrokes, would make just a very, very simple sound to convey that you actually struck a key. Now, granted, I had to turn the volume down because the people around me would say, what the heck is that? But I actually really enjoyed the experience of typing on this device. Now, 10 years later, I wouldn't ever use the touch cover to write an essay, but I did manage to write up a lot of this review specifically on the touch cover. The trackpad hasn't aged so well either. I would argue that the trackpad was never very good in that it uses a you know capacitive sensor on the top in order to figure out where your finger is moving and it's not incredibly accurate. This is the time where most laptops, at least Windows laptops, didn't have good trackpads in the first place. And so it really wasn't a high bar and a high standard, but this really didn't stand up to it. I still remember the first day that I walked in and the Microsoft salesman ended up clicking in the touch cover and then hanging the surface from the touch cover. And my mind was just blown and I was so nervous because at the time, the Microsoft Surface RT was a very expensive device, especially for a struggling, starving college student. Now, today I wouldn't do that with my Surface Pro either, but it's nice. it was nice to know that the magnets were strong enough to comfortably connect to the bottom of the Surface RT. The speakers on either side of this device were actually solid. You could not have to plug in earbuds and listen to Netflix on this quite easily. And generally the device is small enough such that it's pretty easy to hold in one hand and hold over long periods of time. It's not built as much as an iPad to be a tablet, clearly because it's so much squarer and taller. And using it in portrait mode means that you're going to get a very tall aspect ratio display. Let's talk about that display. Now at the time, the 1366 by 768 pixel resolution was decent and pretty up there, especially for a kind of more mid-range device like this. And the display quality was substantially better than most of the other devices that I ever used. Now granted, most other devices had TN panels that were pretty poor, at least the low-end ones that I was switching from. And this, being an LCD, was brighter and with better viewing angles and just a lot cleaner. Now, granted, being a glossy touch surface display, it's going to have problems with fingerprints, just like any surface sense it. One more thing that I'll mention before we get to the actual software and experience. Interestingly enough, like many iPads at the time, there was a camera on the back and a camera at the front. Now, Microsoft decided to kind of change up the formula by making the camera at the back tilt at the opposite angle of the, the tilt created by the kickstand. And so I think it's something like 22 degrees, if I remember off the top of my head. And so then when you're sitting it down on a surface, it actually takes a picture directly forward rather than taking a picture down into whatever surface you're standing on. Pretty cool. Now granted, every surface since then or at least any surface with the adjustable, fully adjustable kickstand doesn't have that feature. Instead, it just has a normal camera. So then if you're taking the picture with the, the surface lifted, then it will be directly ahead of you rather than offset. I, I, it was a cool feature at the time, but I don't think I actually ever used this camera for anything practical, especially because it was so low quality. Let's talk about the software. Now, Windows RT is highly contentious. A lot of people hated it. And there's a couple reasons for that that are justified, a couple that I don't think are. First of all, people were very, very familiar to the desktop environment of Windows 7. So switching away and no longer having a traditional desktop, at least on first boot, was confusing, which I completely understand. 
But for anyone entering in the PC market or anyone who isn't like fixed and set on it on the experience, it was actually a good experience, at least for me. I, while I had been using Windows 7 and before that Windows XP and Windows Vista and all the Windows versions, I never was really too set on the my experience. And as soon as I switched to Windows RT, my experience got a lot better because I was using a Surface. Now, granted, if you're using a desktop computer, like a 30 inch de or 24 inch desktop computer, and you're trying to use this sort of experience, I can understand how it could be a little bit of a change of pace. But I loved Windows RT, and I was probably the only one to love Windows RT. But let me talk about why. So first of all, just like any sort of modern operating system for tablets, it was built for touch. In that, yes, you have this home screen, but also you had some great, great gesture navigation that we'll get to. Then the other thing that's built for touch is all of the Windows applications. Microsoft was really pushing every single developer to create an application for Windows. And we'll talk about the app cap as well, but all of the applications built by Microsoft are actually really good experiences. They have, they have different UI interactions that even modern applications haven't gotten to. So for example, selecting multiple objects on a screen, quite often you would swipe up on the objects and it would add it to your selection. Now, granted, if someone wasn't familiar with that, then it wouldn't mean anything. But for people who had actually gotten used to the system and gotten used to Windows RT, being able to select multiple objects by just swiping up on them was awesome. Let's talk about those gestures. You can swipe in from the right in order to quickly get to charms, which are basically localized settings based on whatever application you're currently in. So if you wanna share something from an application, sure, just swipe in from the right, hit the share icon, and then you'll be given your share menu or you can swipe between applications using swipe in from the right or from the left, which was incredible. Honestly, this is the best way to switch between applications. And I'd love for Microsoft to bring it back in basically the Surface Pro 9. Don't wanna keep an application open? Sure, just swipe down from the top all the way to the bottom. That's it. What if you want to basically split screen applications? Well, then I'm gonna open up an application, I'm gonna swipe down, not all the way, and then move it to the left, right? Take the weather application. Oh, there it goes, it opened up right next to it. Like, like it's so obvious that I'm surprised that no sort of tablet operating systems have copied it since. Oh, resize the application, oh my gosh. Now granted, it wasn't perfect, there were a lot of things that you need to get used to. For example, within applications, you can actually sometimes swipe up from the bottom to access another sort of menu. Within Internet Explorer, for example, you could swipe up from the bottom and then access your tabs. I was trying to watch a YouTube video on this earlier, which we'll get to the performance soon here. Um, I, this was actually fine, honestly. Internet Explorer, I know Internet Explorer gets so much hate, and it's because people dealt with terrible versions of Internet Explorer, but I think the version of Internet Explorer that showed up on Surface devices, I think it was Internet Explorer 10, was actually a pretty good experience. It was slow and it was a little bit buggy, but I wish Microsoft had a modern Expl Internet Explorer browser or a modern Edge browser that worked more like the original Internet Explorer for Surface RT because it was so targeted towards the touch experience. Windows Metro UI finally has gone away with Windows 11 now, because Windows 10 had barely held on to it by preserving kind of the Metro tiles structure with the home with the start menu. Now we're we unfortunately don't have it anymore. And for the most part, I think that makes sense, right? If all you're doing is basically having applications that are static and always look the same, then generally having having these massive sort of tiles dedicated to different applications doesn't make any sense. Now, granted, the point of this Metro UI was eventually to get to live tiles, which live tiles were, and they're practical if you plan on staying on the home screen. Being able to basically start up your Surface, sit on the home screen and quickly see the score of the game that you're curious about, the weather outside, 
any calendar events that you have upcoming without having to go within applications in an era where opening applications took a lot longer made a lot of sense. Now in a modern day where we can open up applications like that, and it doesn't take many seconds to wait for an application to load, the Metro UI tile structure doesn't make quite as much sense. That idea has kind of lived on in widgets in modern Android and iOS devices, but I don't think either have really mirrored the sort of unified design of live tiles. Maybe I just have a bias, but something about all of these colors on one single screen, it's just pretty and all the colors mesh together really well. I, I still really love it. Now, one thing that hasn't held up over the years is the performance. Now, even at the time, the NVIDIA Tegra chip wasn't all that capable, at least in terms of raw processing power. One advantage that the Surface RT had over a lot of other laptops is that instead of a spinning hard drive, it used flash storage, which for short, quick loads, it was actually pretty snappy. So getting around opening applications comparatively to my Dell laptop at the time was actually a pretty good experience. But any sort of real deep processing power, like say gaming, was not really that possible on the Surface RT. Sure, little mobile games were possible, but nothing all that you know weighty, especially because it didn't run any sort of desktop application only desk, only applications through the Windows Store. Now, my typical use case for the Surface RT at the time was browsing the web, going on to social media sites like Facebook, going into Netflix, watching Netflix, watching Hulu, and most importantly, Office. And as far as an Office machine, the Surface RT was incredibly capable. Being able to run full desktop Office on a tablet was just such a huge departure from what we were familiar with especially back in 2012. Now, even today, it's not really all that likely that most people are running desktop versions of Office on their tablets unless they have a Windows device. Now, granted, now technically iPads and Android devices have access to mobile versions of Office that are getting a little bit closer, but they still don't stand up to true desktop Office that you would get on the Surface RT. It's crazy to think that I could build a financial model faster on a 10 year old Surface RT than I could on a brand new iPad Pro with an M1 chip. I'm actually curious to see whether I could. I'd have to use Google Sheets, for example, and I'm curious whether I could be fast enough in Google Sheets to outstrip the fact that I don't have any sort of processing performance on the Surface RT. Maybe if you wanna see that video one day, let me know down in the comments, cause it would be a fun one to do. I'm not going to lie to you and say that the Surface RT was a powerhouse, because it certainly wasn't. Even to other tablets at the time, the Surface RT was largely not very fast. But honestly, that didn't bother me. I was fine with that because all it meant was I could quickly get to the applications that I wanted and I could have it in this tiny little compact form factor. Which remember, this was my first tablet. And so the concept of having everything that I previously would need to access using my computer in this was just mind blowing for me. Now, before I mentioned that the Surface RT changed my perspective on technology, and that's kind of a big order, a tall order that I'd like to explain a little bit. Before I started using the Surface RT, um, all of my devices were tools. They were just basically ways to get to where I wanted to go. If I, for example, wanted to play a game, then I'd pick up my laptop, I'd install the game and play it. If I wanted to browse the web, then I'd just pick up my laptop and I'd browse the web. And, and it's all pretty direct. The Surface RT was the type of thing that allowed me to start doing those things in places that I wouldn't have beforehand. So for example, if I happened to get to a class early and I wanted to pick up a quick, watch a quick episode of Netflix, I could do so, and I could do so on a big screen that was actually pretty enjoyable to watch. If I wanted to send a quick email and I happened to be, you know, moving, going from football practice to the locker room, I could just pull this out of my backpack and then quickly send the email. It was a lot easier, especially at the time, than the alternative, which was smartphones that were still really catching up. Especially in a world where I did not have the resources or funds to pay for all the things I could possibly need. 
Now granted, I'm sure there were a lot of capable thin and light laptops at the time, or at least some, that would have been served my needs better. I'm sure if I had the access to an iPad at the time, it probably would have been a better solution for a tablet. And so all of those devices combined could have probably erased my need for the Surface. But it was because of scarcity, because I was not in a position where I could afford those things, that I really started to appreciate the Surface for covering so many bases that would otherwise need to be covered by more devices. A lot has changed since then. Now, I'm not a starving college student anymore. And while I like to be careful with my money, I have the money to afford a Surface Pro 8, a Surface Laptop Studio, a Apple Watch Ultra, and a whole bunch of other great technology and incredible devices that could serve the exact purposes I need them for. Which is cool and is incredible and it's, it's all that I've ever wanted out of the last 10 years. But it's not pushed me into those same sort of situations as much where I could appreciate something like the Surface RT for the versatility it brings for a relatively accessible price point. Now at the time, the Surface RT was not cheap. It's not like the Surface Go equivalent is now. Instead, it's closer to basically the entry level Surface Pro devices, which was unfortunate and it was a huge investment for me. But everyone always points to the iPhone for revolutionizing technology. Where's all the people talking about the Surface? Even now, even now, manufacturers are still moving over to Surface-like two-in-one devices. Why? Why is this such an optimal design for computing? Well, since Windows is still all that not that made for tablet devices, and even the iPad is struggling to figure out the right balance between desktop operating system and mobile operating system, I think the reason why this is such an incredible computer is the fact that it's so tiny and portable and the keyboard you can just snap in at any time. This is still smaller than most laptops. Even the Surface Pro 8 with its included laptop or keyboard is still smaller than most laptops which means that you can carry it around and, and keep it compact anywhere you want. And generally, most computers are moving in the smaller direction. Surf, or the MacBook Air M2, for example, is also moving in the smaller direction. Really, the only thing keeping devices moving smaller now is actually the keyboard. I've never seen a huge positive reception for any computing device that's smaller than this keyboard, for example. Now. Obviously, people are, you know, happy about phones and what they, they can do, and people are happy about small tablets like iPad minis, but never are they really built to be computing devices. The Surface RT, or now you could say the Surface Go, is like the raw minimum we can get to still be a good computer, and some people don't even believe that. Now, is it hypothetically possible to shrink a computer to be smaller than this? I suppose so. I think it's possible, and I think it's going to come from one place. If I were to pick my number one successor to what the Surface RT was 10 years ago, I'd say it's foldables. Now, I'm going to do a deep dive on the Galaxy Z Fold 4 pretty soon here, and so get subscribed to the channel if you're interested in that. But really, even outside of just the Fold 4, I want to express how even Microsoft over 10 years ago put together this promotional video explaining how they view the future of technology. And in that future, they saw kind of compact, portable devices that you could fold outwards or expand outwards into larger screens. Now, that was way before, before foldable devices even were you know, possible. And so it's clear that Microsoft had some foresight in that. But I honestly believe that if we want to keep computing, and we want to do it on the go, then foldable-like devices, or maybe rollables, are going to be a solution there. But we can deep dive in that in another video. Here are my final thoughts on the Surface RT, and they might be the, my last thoughts leading up to the eventual 20-year anniversary of the Surface. The Surface RT was incredible, and I think it was really not given enough credit for what it's become and what it has started in the entire computing world. Now, granted, Microsoft has continued to push the ball forward, so the Surface RT wasn't a complete failure, but 
it's clear that Microsoft and Apple still are at odds on what they think computing will look like. My Surface RT, it's gonna stick around, hopefully for another 10 years, maybe because it doesn't have nearly the same amount of value as it did before, but it just is a reminder to me how much technology can change our lives. And so I'm always going to have a lot of nostalgia for it, if that's not obvious. Thank you for watching NOI. So I hope you like this 10 year review of the Surface RT. If you did, be sure to let me know it in the comments and keep an eye out for the rest of our videos coming this October. This is Microsoft Tober. I'm basically deep diving on all kinds of Surface devices, celebrating the 10 year anniversary. And I hope you stick around for the ride. Thanks for watching and I'll catch the next one.